Welcome to the latest episode of the Quimby's Bookstore Podcast. This episode, we have Adam Parfrey, publisher of Feral House and Process Books, which comprise many of the books we carry at Quimby's that have to do with miscreants, mayhem, outer limits, conspiracy theory, the occult. Adam Parfrey is a writer and a publisher of books like Apocalypse Culture Volumes 1 and 2, Cult Rapture, Revelations of the Apocalyptic Mind, and others, and more. And he sat down to talk with us about his book, Ritual America, Secret Brotherhoods and Their Influence on American Society, A Visual Guide, which he co-authored with Craig Heimbichner. And it's a beautiful, scrapbooky-ish book with hundreds of rare and many never-before-printed images about secret societies like the Freemasons and the Odd Fellows. There's ads for things like Masonic supply companies, cartoons lampooning Masonic ritual, gag ritual set pieces. It even has some stuff about Anton LaVey and the Church of Satan. I should also mention the actual design of the book is really cool, and it's designed by Sean uh, Tesserachi, editor of the amazing and infamous collage zine Crab Hound. Also, this interview features Peter Sotos, who we'll talk with more later in the interview, although you can kind of hear him occasionally while Adam talks. He's chiming in. Peter Sotos is in the interview because Peter and Adam are friends that go way back, and they bicker in ways that are very amusing. Uh, Farrell House, the publisher that Adam is the publisher of, published a book Peter Sotos edited entitled Pure Filth, which is an annotated collection of transcripts culled and transcribed by Sotos from the underground pornography of the late Jamie Gillis. Anyway, the interview starts with Adam Parfrey talking about Ritual America, and it occurs to me now, why didn't we talk about the lack of women in secret societies other than the role of women as high priestesses and ceremonies um, often conducted by men? I don't know. I don't have a good answer for this, but I do think there is a lot of interesting topical stuff that we talked about in this interview, like the difference between cults and religions, the fine line between frat and subculture, the forces of sex and death, and how people just want to belong to something, and oh yeah, the burning issue of Shriners, philanthropists or sadistic clown promoters. Oh, and a quick note, the goat book we made reference to was called The Lodge Goat, Goat Rides, Butts, and Goat Hairs by C.B. Pettibone. Uh, so, without further ado, I bring you live from the deep, scary Quimby's basement with the phone ringing and everything, a discussion with writer, editor, and publisher Adam Puffy. Good afternoon. My name's Adam Parfrey from Feral House Press and also run Process Media, another company. First, we should talk about um, the Masons and what the symbol looks like. That's an icon on a lot of Masonic bling, I guess. Yeah. So why don't you describe that for the listeners, and and I will also put a picture up on the um, site of what that looks like. You're speaking about the square and the triangle and yeah. uh, that uh, represents the building, the uh, architecture, symbolism, because Masons, by the way, your name is Liz Mason, mm -hmm. and so that's interesting <laughs> tie into this talk. Anyway, um, but the Freemasonry, they, they, you know, I'm talking about Freemasonry is defined by the Europeans and the UK, and the American ones is sort of like a takeoff from that. And it's not exactly the same, you know. But the history of it is that um, Freemasonry was begun in Egyptian times and then during Old Testament era as well. Um, so this, this build up onto the historical importance of the architect and the godlike concepts being transmitted down to them. And they pick it up through this fraternal order. And that's why they keep secrets, because it's straight from God himself, and so they're not going to let things things loose. However, there's other reasons for the secrets, um, and the, the main reason was the conflict with the Catholic Church. And, um, it, it, you know, in the, in the mid, Middle Ages, uh, there was a Scottish group of pirates who were uh, later connected with Freemasons and all that, and they were doing their own financial setup and um, moving goods from here to there under the noses of the uh, Catholic Church and the monarchy and 
and uh, the tax set up of them and so on and that they were not in charge of that so that particularly is the main reason why the Pope invoked against uh, the Freemasons and then of course if you remember the um, French Revolution was going on about the same time the American Revolution was going on and then the French uh, Grand Order the Grand Orient Lodges uh, run by Lafayette and others at General Lafayette uh, was in in line with uh, Ben Franklin and supporting the American revolutionary effort against the Masons in Britain. Mm -hmm. So it was like an interior internal war among Freemasons and that was the revolution. The thing with the G that's inside yes. the Freemason symbol, a lot of people think that the G in that symbol stands for the the grand, what is it, the grand, grand architect? Grand architect of yeah. the universe, yes. Yeah, but that actually it stands for gestation, or, ge or what was Generative. it? Generative. Generative. <laughs> but, yeah, but it is, it's a polite way of saying sex, but... Um, yeah, that's the, it means two things. There, there are many double, triple, quadruple meanings within the, um, the, the iconography of Freemasonry and the, the meanings you get to know another meaning as you climb up the hierarchy, you know, and get a higher degree. Um, so they, they can't tell you everything at once. And you'll learn bit by bit, and you're finally up to the 33rd degree, you will know all, you know? Mm -hmm. It's sort of like becoming, what is that called when you become the cleared uh, oh, Scientology? Scientology? Yeah, yeah that's my parable for that uh, Masonic hierarchy. Yeah, I loved, in the book, there is some talk about Scientology. Yeah. They're one of many, arguably, cults mm -hmm. and or kind of homebrewed religions that yeah. is somewhat based on like they take some of the sort of structure the sort of masonic layout yeah well i don't see masons as being a cult per se for the only reason is that they were so huge it wasn't a small enough entity to be called a cult what's the difference between cult and religion it's the number of members primarily right mm. so it, it, for example, they're talking about this Mormon presidential candidate. Is Mormonism a cult? Or are there enough Mormons in the world now that's no longer a cult, but an actual religion? Same thing with Freemasonry. There's so many people involved with Masonic or Freemasonry or Masonic like organizations. At one time at the turn of the century, one out of every three people in the United States belonged to that. Um, of course, um, the Catholics, after a while, there, w there was so much jealousy because there were so many people belonging, wanting to belong to these fraternal orders, that they created their own fraternal order at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, called Knights of Columbus. And it, that that's just out of jealousy of uh, the amount of members among like, them. Like, I want my own order, too. Correct, but, yeah. Because everybody wants to belong to a secret society or a club. Everybody yeah. wants to feel like they belong to something. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, it was, it was really important at a time when there wasn't a, as many bars, for example, mm -hmm. and then or many clubs to go to, to, to run away from your family, or run away from the kids and wife and so on. And that is based on this, like, patriarchal concept um, so that the men can get together. It's like a good old boy network, basically. And um, that's how it happened. This is something that I, I want to touch on because I found this interesting. So in the book, there's discussion about, um, there was like a word that was used, I forget what it was. It was something about, you know, making someone a brother, brithering, the, 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 to take a man and to make him a mason, a brother among masons. The Scots happily refer to it as brithering. <laughs> and brothering and so what yeah. that made me think about was like ubiquitous use of like hey bro 
Yes. You know, which seems really sort of frat-like to me. And mm -hmm. frats are basically based yeah. on that sort Correct. of structure. Correct, like the college frat concept yeah. came and directly so, from that. Yeah. yeah, and so, but which is interesting because when I think of, like, dark, the dark arts and all that, like, my mind does kind of go towards, you know, secret societies and Crowley and his OTO and, mm -hmm. you know, all that stuff. But to a certain degree, it's the same thing as a frat. Yeah. Well, certainly, yeah. And, but but those two things seem to be on, like, the opposite ends of the continuum in terms of, like, you know, sort of subcultural or sort of anti-disestablishmentarian, blah, 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 <laughs> and, and, like, hey, bro. Yeah. But well, yet. Well, the frat concept, uh, it really diminishes the importance of a fraternal order to the people within the orders themselves. They say, we're important. We have the the through line to God, you know. this These are the secrets uh, that you should know to really become a, a true human being and take care of your family and take care of the country and all that. But what it is, is just a collective of people who like to drink together and pal around and have network and all that stuff. So um, that's essentially the situation. But th that's like to be built up in this incredible way. If you go to uh, D.C. or Arlington, Virginia, and see these buildings, it's just like there's so much money put in, so much effort, and you know these, these like, like grand cathedrals and a kind of this quasi this fraternal lodge concept. You know, it's like there's Notre Dame, and then there are these huge Masonic entities. Really. Interesting. Yeah, and also that a lot of them, like Rotary, for example, yeah, are basically there as a source of goodwill. Yeah, and to give financial or communal help or mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. like the Shriners Children's Hospitals. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, let's talk about the Shriners Children's <laughs> Hospitals. My um, favorite topic. Yes. So please just talk about that because it's. I, I don't know if this is quite the right word. Amusing, I think. Yeah. Well, you could say that. <laughs> um, of course, Shriners is it's it, that that uh, organization is no longer for the purpose of learning, as uh, Scottish Rite Freemasonry or York Rite Freemasonry is. These are graduates of that. These are so-called raised uh, fellows, raised Masons. They pass the third degree, and so they can go on and so on. So they go into this fun club called the Shriners, and the purpose of the Shriners is uh, to carry on philanthropic gestures and so on. So they, the, there are these hospitals, all these donations, and then this fixation on getting dressed up as clowns. And they have their own magazines for these Shriners clowns. And... Um, and the man, what's a magazine? It's like clowning around or something. What was no, it? No, I, I forget the t the name of it. But it's in the book. But yeah. It's like, yeah, but it's a monthly magazine uh, for only Shriner readers. It's not for even outside the the organization and and clowns at Barnum and Bailey who may or may not be Shriner clowns, what have you. But the thing is, is that. These people are so fixated on com competing against one another to be the best clown and to go to the Shriner hospitals and to uh, entertain children. And then you, you look into this and there's, there, there is a particular type of uh, a psychological problem of people afraid of clowns. Yeah, I think it's, in the book you talked about they, yeah. they've done studies. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So they're not paying attention to these studies where they show that children are scared shitless by clowns <laughs> and so on. So there's a strange little context there. Is this all philanthropy, philanthropy or is it something else going on there? I don't know. I don't know. What I enjoyed is that there's a picture of children looking not thrilled to yeah. be with the clowns. And these are pictures taken on the basis of Shriners hiring photographers to promote the Shriner concept. And then there are children like looking freaked out and very sad and depressed. I wonder, you know, were they not observant of this? I'm not sure. What's the Fez all about? Why the Fez? 
Uh, there are a lot of different ideas of what the Fez is. It's what the people who are anti-Shriners say uh, that it comes from Turkey, and it's when there was a slaughter of Christians there. Uh, people would dip their hats in the Christian blood, and that's why it was a red Fez, and so on. There was another concept going around that people had, the, the, the people who started the Shriners organizations, they were actors in the late 19th century, and actors, like, they, they wore a lot of costumes, and they had a lot of uh, weird regalia fascinations and going on. So it's it just coincidental that these things happen. But it, it, if you go through the ritual, the Shriners ritual, the weirdest thing of all when you're initiated to Shriners is that you have one hand on the King James Bible, on the other hand on the Quran. So initiates and Shriners have to pray to Allah and have their hand on the Quran huh. as part of the initiation. It, it's strange to think of these uh, very conservative middle-class Americans are praying on the Quran and, and, do, and also invoking uh, if they were telling secrets that they would poke their eyes out and doing these awful things that if, if they had revealed any of the secrets of the club they are. I see it as part of like a club thing, you know. So there are many bizarre aspects of the 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 secret orders, the fratern fraternity groups and fraternal groups that are if you really look at it and see what the words are in these particular rituals and you see the costumes and what it represents to many people and not just to them, it's a curious thing. Yeah. <laughs> Here's another topic that yes. I find curious, and that is this business with the goats. <laughs> of course, people understand goats to be a kind of a satanic, has a satanic quality to it. The cloven hoof concept and all that. And when uh, Freemasons, um, the, there was uh, the Catholic Church was running against them and calling them names and all that, they were goat lovers and they had this kind of a baphomet images of the of a kind of a satanic image that these are what the freemasons are and that's what it is so it ran against uh freemasonry to begin with and then freemasonry said ah goats we don't have a problem with goats well it became an internal joke we are goat lovers yes and they put out postcards promoting this concept that we are the worst things that could be said about it was a little punk rock on their part to do this and they um so they had these uh postcards with the goats and hot women writing them the hot women of the era you know but the thing is is that um all the various uh fraternal orders whether they were woodmen of the world or odd fellows they also brought on that goat concept as a kind of that internal joke, you know, and sort of like it was grouped them together. You know, I think punk rock, what did they say that, you know, we're the worst people in the world, we can't get any, you know, that, that concept, uh, it was sort of a similar concept that was brought on by the, the fraternal orders with this goat thing. This, this one book you were speaking of is six hundred pages in length with illustrations and little jokes and one-liners and all that it's really astounding that such a thing exists i would love like from my ridiculous personal quimmies level like i i think if they made postcards that we could sell of those uh -huh. those would sell like hotcakes oh yeah yeah okay well i'll look into that <laughs> Do a book on those, please. Um, or print and with perforated pages. Oh yeah, can... so you can send them to your best friend here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, we're having a good time with that goat. Wish you were here. <laughs> so, you have been initiated. Do you want to talk about any personal experience with that? Yes, I'll talk about my personal experience of being initiated into a. In one of these orders, it was the um, Odd Fellows group. A friend in uh, Waxahachie, Texas, is a town outside of Dallas, 
And he why went, there? Well, because he lives there and he has a gallery, uh, and he collects and sells all this. All, he goes to lodges that are being closed down, and gets all their ephemera and banners and costumes and all that. And it's a great guy. And it's a great gallery, and I went to his uh, house and hung out there for a while. Right took on salmonella poisoning while I was there in a bad Mexican restaurant. But in any Was case, that part of the hazing ritual? I hope so. I hope not, actually. So he said, how are you going to do a book about fraternal wars without being initiated and going through that? And I said, well, perhaps you're right. I, I, I was didn't really want to do it particularly, but I agreed to do this at the, this Waxahachie Lodge. And you walk in there, there's like a um, hundred years of dust on everything. The people within the group, most of them were 90 and older. It was strange. It was like walking into a Charles Dickens novel or something. And then it, it was curious. So, and then this 90 year old guy uh, to initiate me, and he doesn't remember it. So he's like prompted by other people there what to say and what to do. And then I wear these hoodwink things, and that which is a that that word being hoodwinked is uh, comes from that. It's a Masonic word on the basis of wearing uh, spectacles that you cannot see through. It's like there's a, a, a black glaze on it, and then when you get to the end and you're going through the revelation of the, inter then those black you know, things you cannot see through or lift it up. And sometimes there are blindfolds and other ways of doing that sort of thing. But, yeah, I went through this um, step by step. It was like 12 steps. It was like a Christmas celebration or something. And at the end, the, the big revelation of what you see, I was really looking forward to this, was that they bring you to, uh, now you can lift up your spectacles and your hoodwinks and and I see the skeleton, a cheap plastic skeleton in um, a coffin, a cheap wooden coffin. And that was supposed to give me a revelation. Did it? Yeah, I thought the pretty damn cheap for a for a initiation to a fraternal lodge. <laughs> but in any case, I'm, yeah, I, th I you know, I'm looking further into the meaning of it and, and all that. And. You know, it's it's all about death. It's all about, and it, if you get to the big G, it's about the generative powers, sex and death, sex and death. What more about our culture? You know, people have to pay attention to are those two ideas, and uh, that's what is it is it's about. Then, Onfellows is big on funeral things and taking care of the family of their fellow brothers, and. Um, so that's the main reason it existed, because the it when people died in an earlier age, particularly in um, you know the turn of the century, what would happen to the family? Who'd take care of the wife? Who'd take care of the children? This was a huge issue that the government did not uh, impose on or take part of. There was no such thing as social security then, and all, all that those things. So Medicare, nothing like that. So it became taken care of by a fraternal orders like this on fellows. That's another main reason these things were formed. Did you, in fact, learn a secret handshake or password yes, that you they, may or may not tell me, depending on your comfort no, level? No, they, they, they gave me a secret handshake and a secret password. And to tell you the truth, I can't even recall it. <laughs> I've forgotten it. The rapture's going to happen and you won't be able to go. Well, that's... <laughs> I, I've earned that <laughs> dishonor. You're already going to hell, probably. Um, probably. <laughs> you know better than I do. Now, here's something that's interesting, too. So, this business about JFK not being an initiated person, yeah. and possibly that may... If you, if you subscribe to those varieties of different types of conspiracy theory yeah. about the assassination that mm -hmm. you know one theory is it is because he didn't belong to any well there or are the rights 
association. Well, yeah, there's a lot of uh, ideas circulating around. Uh, I don't know how much credibility that has, but there's a coincidental concept, though. Uh, JFK, of course, being Catholic, was not an initiated member of the of Freemasonry. Uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, as vice president, who became president right after his death, was. Um, and then the Warren Commission, Earl Warren, the Supreme Court Justice, who led that investigation into the assassination. And, of course, it was an incomplete uh, investigation um, at best. And so you have that situation where everybody who was uh, on uh, the Warren Commission was a 32 or 33rd degree Freemason. The guy they're investigating was not. They're, they're, they're opposing points of view, opposing concepts, opposing beliefs. And I don't know what to make of that, except it's an odd coincidence. What's interesting, in 2004, two bonesmen, that's what they call it, George W. Bush and John Kerry were running for president. So... Either one won, you would have a bonesman as a president. And a bonesman, by the way, is one of the... Members of the Skull and Bones, the Yale College group of uh, very highly selective and uh, highly ritualized uh, ceremonial. They, have, they call it Skull and Bones because it's a very death image and the initiation ceremonies and all that. And fascinating for that reason. But what does it mean? You can draw a lot of uh, inferences into what's going on. But is that all true? I don't. I can't tell you for sure. What if maybe also if there was some sort of like divine, not some sort of gnostic, mystic knowledge that you would get if you're initiated into the society? Maybe as an audience, when we see that type of imagery, we think like, oh, we'll be satisfied if we only learn what they know. And that there's somehow some sort of satisfactory advance or answer, like, why are we here? Why blah, 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 blah. You know, that somehow if only we were initiated and got that knowledge, we would have the answers. Mm -hmm. Of course. That's why you join those groups in part mm -hmm. for that revelation that's supposed to occur. Did you feel like you got any sort of revelation when you were initiated? No, I did not have a mystic revelation uh, at that time. I, Maybe you Not had a mystic at revelation at a totally unrelated incident. Perhaps so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a website that you would like to tell the audience to visit in regards to the topics that we've talked about today? Perhaps well, where they can find your books. Absolutely. You can come to uh, a Feral House and Process Media Inc. websites. Um, uh, it's easy to find and has a list of all our books and we've done about 150 and most of them are in print now and so uh, so all I can say is to visit check it around check around and look at it. and of course we do also sell Ritual America at Quimby's thank you very much thank you so much for having me In this next part of the podcast, we have an interview with Peter Sotos. He describes his collaborative effort with gonzo porn maven Jamie Gillis. Jamie Gillis uh, toured over 100 films and as such was a primary performer in pornography's golden age. Gillis is also known for inventing the gonzo genre of pornography, played out in the film Boogie Nights by Burt Reynolds' character, who was based on Jamie Gillis. Peter Sotos edited a book called Pure Filth, which was published by Feral House, which appears as transcripts from the films Jamie produced during these early years of radical and highly personal pornography. Extreme novelist Peter Sotos was a good friend of Jamie Gillis, and Sotos's unusual perspective makes this volume possible. Peter Sotos is a Chicago-born writer whose work focuses on criminal psychology, 
sexual abjection, and the myriad aspects of pornography. He is also an early member of the noise group White House. He is noted for his unique literary style and his frank and insightful engagement with deeply disturbing subjects. Peter Sotos's writings are considered by many to stand as oblique social criticism. He is the author of 11 published novels, including Index, Selfish Little, The Annotated Leslie Ann Downey. His writing has appeared in Answer Me, Apocalypse Culture 2, Funeral Party, and Ritual Sex. Recently, his books Tool and Mine were printed simultaneously by Nine Banded Books. Uh, my name is Peter uh, Sotis, and I'm here to... Um talk about this thing pure film and i'm there's some question about uh, who the author of this thing is so <laughs> let's talk about so the reason that we were thoughtful about whether we should say that you're the author is mm. because a lot of this book is composed of a few essays and some pictures but mostly transcripts from movies that were made by jamie gillis he's mm. sort of known as sort of like the Ooh, the father of gonzo porn, I right. guess. Um, and these are transcripts from... Well, I'll let you talk about the rest. Uh, they're transcripts from um, sort of underground movies that he would release. Uh, that it, When he, was, he became known as a porn actor, when there was actually a, a market for such things, you know, actually in theaters and whatnot. And, but the things I transcribed were things that he would do, um, not privately, but he would... Uh, just do them on, on his own, and then sell them to a very small amount of people. Okay, so these movies um, were part of a series that he called On the Prowl, right? Some of them are. So, yeah. Some of them yeah. are. And it, sounded, it looked like maybe like there was like a more than one series? Yeah, yeah. yeah. On, on the Prowl was his uh, commercial stab. That, that's, that's when he was actually trying to... Uh, this is back when... Uh, porn was sold on video and so he was actually trying to establish a company and came up with this idea which was it's become popular because of um whatever that director's name is who did boogie nights yes so he based a character on that but this whole idea of gonzo uh where you know it's pov basically you know people just keep the cameras to the interaction all that sort of shit yeah and they talk um, to the camera well. right that, and, that yeah. was considered sort of like uh, really, sort of cutting edge at the time. I don't, what wasn't? I don't, I don't think he was aware that it was like. Well, he does say actually, oddly enough, that uh, in one of the introductions, he wrote introductions to each transcript, and he he does say that he was aware of that. So I shouldn't say that he was aware that this was something really new and exciting. Um, the truth is, and I don't know how you feel about this, but uh, it it doesn't seem like a big jump. It to me, it it really Gonzo is sort of. Um, it, it's not so much a genre. It, it's it's become considered that, but it's uh, it's really just a very cheap way to do these films. When you know, if you're selling porn, people just want to masturbate, so they actually didn't really care about you know the cowboy script or, or all this sort of stuff. So it was yeah, just like a very cheap right way. Yeah, and, yeah, and and it was just incredibly uh, cheap. You could produce it this way. Uh, the reason Jamie um, separated himself from that, um, not not by uh, just because it was him that would separate himself. It wasn't like he had to try to do this, but that uh, he was interested in more than just showing the porn. And everyone since who's done, you know, quote unquote gonzo are really just, you know, hacks. So, Jamie, there was something else going on. Well, what I found interesting was that in one of his essays, he talks about, like, 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 ah, oh, the kids now when they make porn, they're not. They're not yeah. doing it right. Like, that to me was hilarious because it was like, like, he sounds like, <laughs> like, hey, kids, get off of my lawn. <laughs> you know, like. No, I, I think it, uh, I think the quote you're referring to is he said, we started off as um, revolutionaries. Uh, what was that? I forgot what the middle part was. We started as revolutionaries, became filmmakers, and ended up as whores. And, and the, the fact is, he was he was always a bit of a whore, but um, the question you know of being a whore is exactly who's paying you, and and by the time he got to his, um, you know none of this is pejorative. I, I, I think what Jamie did was amazing. Obviously, I spent a lot of fucking time doing it, but um, 
he, he didn't like uh, the business that was coming into it. He, th he thought there were better ideas. But the truth is that idea of, of being a revolutionary um, is, is sort of quaint. And if you push Jamie, I don't really think he believed that. I'm, I'm, he had a bit of um, professionalism about him. Mm -hmm. you know? but well, and I feel like this, is a, this helps maybe summarize his um, experience, is that he said, um, we, what did he say? We fucked for the fun of it, and the money was just gravy. Yeah. But who would believe that? Who fucks for the fun of it, first of all? <laughs> well, and um, especially also because, well, he would... Like, if you read some of the transcripts, like, he really is trying to talk people into it. He's negotiating for how much money they're going to get or whatever, but, yeah. like, like, it's not like he has, like, release forms that people are signing. Well, he did during the On the Prowl things, but the, 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 the absolute truth of this is, and, and it's, it's, it's very difficult for me to talk for Jamie. First of all, you know, he's, he's not here, but um, I, I really want to sort of leave whatever Jamie said basically alone. I can, I can have my own opinions and stuff, and I do probably go on a little bit too much about them. But the absolute truth of that is that, as far as I'm concerned, is uh, that whole fucking deal is done before it gets started. So he might be saying, and he does say in there, he'll say, you know, five dollars more and let, you know, put the shit in your mouth. Yeah, honestly, that, that's what's going on. Um, but I guarantee you that both parties knew what was going to happen. That that deal had been, you know, set. And if if you know, like, uh, if, if if in any sort of situation like this, you you tell someone to turn off the fucking camera and you get up and leave. They weren't leaving, and you can say, oh, they were there because of drugs or whatever. They're, you know, they desperately needed lunch that day. But um, you don't make those decisions for that kind of. Do you, you know what I mean? So so, I, so if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying. The negotiation process that's happening, they'd already made a deal, and that... No, no, it's, it's, it's real in the sense that it's, um, it is really happening. There's this sort of uh, conversation going on. But, uh, I, I hate to use the word, but psychologically, it, it, this was a tacit understanding. And um, what interests me is this, that, that everyone's acting like there's these different things going on and you can sort of make it arty and all that you can sort of make it expansive but but the fact is is no one actually said there there is a bit in there when someone finally does say turn off the fucking camera because it was going too far and i actually use uh, another uh porn star uh working with another filmmaker in the introduction to talk about this idea but uh, again when she's talking about her displeasure at having being treated rough as far as i'm concerned she sounds like a fucking idiot because and and that's what I'm talking about in the thing that she sounds like an idiot because she actually understood the market. To me, I mean, you know, the, these things happen and they're terrible and whatnot. But that's not my interest in it. Or um, we're not talking about things going too far. We're talking about actually stepping in the door. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you you have to sort of consider where you are, what, say what your audience is. I'm gonna I'm gonna switch topics a little bit <laughs> because I I want to be able to give the listeners like a, a sort of Big, uh, a picture of sort of what's going on in these videos. So, uh -huh. like, the type of people that he would, I guess, I don't know if this is quite the right word, recruit um, mm -hmm. to be um, in his projects. Yeah. <laughs> um, these were people, like, who weren't really that... They may have been, like, sex workers, but they weren't necessarily porn stars. They were, like, people out on the street. They were hookers. Or, yeah, yeah. Or, or, like... Like sort of drug, you know, crack. Crack people. words. <laughs> yeah, <you're laughs> <honest>. your words. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, so this, so it, it's a very sort of like you know lo-fi production, and yeah. you know, so maybe you can talk about you know the kind of people that he would. Well, um, the, the the easiest way to say it would be dregs. You know, I mean, detritus or hard. Is that how you pronounce it? <laughs> um, but but the, um, what happens in a lot of it, oddly enough, is is before we sort of get clumsy about typifying these things this way, is that um, some of them are very intelligent, much better than their positions say. You know that uh, a lot of them have good arguments and whatnot. So so, but they're people at you know lower ebbs. Yeah, like we sort of stereotypically like mm -hmm. you know quotes yeah. around you know like the dregs and. 
you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I'm, I'm not, you know, uh, I think it's important to sort of point out that, you know, uh, no one is sort of um, operating under this, under this idea, this, this sort of common idea of, of respect or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's, there's dif- different understandings of what these people are going through, what they have to offer, and, and what Jamie was offering. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so there's, so last night at the event, you were talking about that there's different levels of sort of understanding, mm-hmm. you know, the, the transcripts and that kind of thing, and that part of what interests you about these is that you kind of see that sometimes even though he's talking to to them and having giving them directions that really that's like saying something that he's talking about himself well yeah a lot of the things he was doing um you know i, I don't want to sort of like make a split personality or something or even even worse some sort of you know uh, semiotic thing well, re- really, um, he had done this sort of stuff for so long. And even, like, to the quote you mentioned about, like, you know, having been this and a filmmaker and then finally uh, a whore, he had this, um, you know, uh, an acumen, uh, an understanding of what they've been through, what they have to offer. He also had an understanding of what he wanted sexually, which was incredibly fluid. I mean, he, he actually wasn't as rigid uh, aesthetically. You know, he, he wasn't tied to a certain fetish or whatever. Um, but beyond that, he actually understood what he was asking them to do. He had, he had been through that. So uh, often it sounds as if um, where he's berating someone, uh, it actually comes from experience, but not in a way that he's trying to, you know, transgress that or something, you know, trying to, to uh, some idea of projection or whatever. He was simply using it. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, all, all, of the, all these sort of ideas... Um, get really fucked up um, because the sort of psychological tropes or whatever are, are seem really convenient and the reason I sort of became obsessed with these transcripts is because I knew that there was so much more going on in the language you know, do you know what I mean there, there was uh, and, and I needed to separate them from these sort of porn aesthetics you know like how you would come to I don't, I don't know what porn you look for when you go into the porn store and you say well I'm looking for you know whatever um, this sort of stuff didn't really seem to it needed to be taken away from that. It didn't seem to really apply, although it was sold that way originally. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. So. so there, and that kind of gets into another topic, and that is sort of talking about another sort of oh, I don't know if level of understanding, some additional ingredient <sighs> to um, thinking about this book holistically is that um, I think the word that you used was existential. Yeah, that, that is. By actually, the way, the noise that you're hearing is a phone going off yeah, of a one Mr. Adam Parfrey who is sitting here in the yeah. interview as well because yeah. he's the publisher of the book. But anyway, you notice my phone didn't go off when he was talking. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually more painful is that he's dying to know who's calling. <laughs> um, I actually didn't use the word. I, I, I did use it last night, but I'm, I, I tend to, since we brought up Adam, uh, it's his word. Because he found the, uh, the book to be really, really depressing. And, and I, mean, I don't know what, what your opinion of it is or if you even give a fuck, but it, it's um, after a while, especially when we were working on it, and the uh, person who designed it uh, is uh, Hedy uh, El Colti, who does. Um, um, Semiotext. Yeah, semiotext. Yeah. He is fucking amazing. And he, uh, him. And by the way, audience that listening, semiotext is a publisher, and they um, they they do a lot of sort of uh, avant garde ish books. It's sort of made from people who used to be part of a ton of media. Mm-hmm. I'm staring at my computer while I'm talking. Um, <laughs> anyway, the art style for just the cover of a lot of the books is very sort of minimal and thoughtful. Mm. Well. But he, he had an incredible understanding for the book, and, and all three of us, uh, Adam, Eddie, and uh, myself, uh, just had to work on it, you know, like sort of work out, you know, the, the screen grabs and what we could do and what we couldn't do, and, and after a while, all of us were just sort of miserable, you know. Um, I was probably less miserable than them. I, I, I have, to, have to cop to really liking the book, and I don't expect anyone else to, but these two guys were like going through hell. <laughs> they, and so he became, he, Adam sort of realized that it was more existential in the sense that he just was so depressed after a while. It, it is, the, the whole book um, 
I, I like that the fact that it just it doesn't sort of get worse. It just sort of starts off with like you know you have to sort of want to step into this stuff and and it um, it's not going to get better. It, it just is a lot of this, a lot of a lot of work for very little payoff, and it's it is ugly. So so that is is existential, and in Adam's sense, it's it's existential. In, in my uh, world, it's um, heaven. I don't know. <laughs> so, Adam, do you want to step in and talk about this? Like, do you want to add anything to that? Well, Pete and I uh, worked on this book for quite some time, actually, about a decade or so, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, Pete introduced me to Jamie Gillis, and we, I saw him several times. Uh, before he died, and um, he always wanted to have a big, you know, New York Times bestseller book, and he wrote a, was starting to write a memoir in the middle of it, and he begged me not to publish the Pure Filth book uh, before he was able to sell his memoir. Who's they? Huh. Well, why don't you well, no, but, describe No, Jamie actually asked, Jamie. And, and, and Jamie, had, um, when, when we saw him, Originally, I knew him when he wasn't making a whole lot of money and stuff like that. We, we were just friends. You know, I mean, he was doing okay and stuff like that. But then he, his situation changed. Um, he moved to New York. I knew him lived in San Francisco. And then suddenly um, he had sold this book idea. And because there's a, a ridiculous interest in 70s porn, um, he was able to cash in on that. And then this book became problematic. So, you know. But he had already signed contracts and things like that. But we we were all friends. I mean, it wasn't like that. But so he just actually said that. Oh, you know, I don't want to fuck up. I remember you called one time and said he was supposed to be interviewed by VH1. Yeah. And uh, was this like right after Boogie Nights came out? Was I, that what did it? I think it was actually around the time that Deep Throat bullshit. That, that, yeah. That yeah. Exactly. When Deep Throat was getting a lot of press, you know that the movie. And all that Jenna stuff. Jameson. Uh, yeah. All the porn star books coming out and. Uh, yeah. So people thought they could make make a sum on that, you know. Yeah. But um, yeah, like Ron Jeremy, but you know. But the the boogie nights thing is 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 actually odd. I mean, he talks about it, but um, this does sort of explain kind of what we're talking about. In that, um, what is that idiot's name who did boogie? Paul Thomas Anderson. Okay, so that guy um, uses uh, Jamie. You know, his character, and it's it's really based very um, that scene where they're in the uh, with the, the Bert, limo Bert Reynolds with, uh, character, right? Uh, that's yeah. you know the the Nadir Nader. How do you yeah. say? Well, it depends. I'm from Chicago. I'm not Bert, Bert, supposed Bert, to talk, Bert, but Bert, 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 novel. Yeah. <laughs> then it, it becomes it's, it's, something else. It's it's uh, it's his low point. He's reached you know this incredibly low point, but Jamie, obviously, we're talking about this though. Was very very proud of that moment. So, so that's the, this, that um, disconnect is, is central so, to what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Did you do? Did you? Are were you the one that did all the transcriptions? Yes. So, <laughs> all right. This is a dumb question, and I think I know what the answer is going to be. But why not just send it off to like a transcription service? Obviously, it's you know like they're going to say you're going to be in your head like oh god I don't know what they're going to be thinking or like. Yeah, or maybe you're, maybe you thought like, is this something that could like get me in trouble? With, you know, so like, what oh. went through your mind? Like, what you know? Well, I, I never actually ever. <laughs> it's, it's funny because um, you could get in trouble for this. So a lot of these things were actually sold under the counter. So um, you know, there's obscenity laws, which are misdemeanors, but um, you, porn stores, uh, there is I don't know. Uh, and I, I don't suffer from this, but um, there probably is a bigger market for, for a lot of this sort of stuff. But um, porn stores are, are frightened to death of being arrested for obscenity. So anything that might go a little, look a little weird, they just don't want the, you know, they have to pay legal fees and things like that. So, so there, that would be a concern, actually. But as, as, to be perfectly honest, I never considered uh, giving it to someone to transcribe. It was, it was um, my pleasure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, with with uh, I the book existed before I met Jamie. I I had done these transcripts entirely for myself. And really? The, yeah. Sad, isn't it? What were? Absolutely, it's absolutely true. <laughs> I have so many There's questions no, about that, but yeah. I don't want to put you in a weird position. No. Well, I, weirder than I mean, this. 
the, 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 the fact is, is that I had these films, and uh, this was pre-internet. And, and you I, were like, I'm going to transcribe them. Maybe I'll make a little comic to go with it. Or... Well, see, you see, no, no I'm, I'm not sitting here being rude to you. <laughs> <laughs> you can, you can, you can. Be this just, just lends itself to making jokes. I'm sorry. This is my life, woman. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> no, no, I, I understand. The, 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 the fact is, and <laughs> it's, it's. I guess it's a difficult sell. But, no, no, but no, no, no. Let me explain. Let yeah, me okay. just explain. And, okay. and you can, you know, I'm, I'm aware of the jokes, and, yeah. and you know, can you imagine being this lonely? But the, the, the fact is, as I said. Um, I became obsessed with these films, with with this idea that there was more there than what was being seen. And and if you want a sort of uh, fairly vulgar way to understand it, is I was I was really sick of watching people eat shit, and I was I was sick of you know. Because um, he does that, and he has that happening. In yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And but but even I don't, I don't even care like any porn. I mean, I mean the aesthetics of porn disgust me. The aesthetics of um, uh, sex, I, I just I really don't care about cum shots or pit sizes or any of these sort of things. I just, so I knew that here, uh, there was something else going on. And I, and I, for my own edification, wanted to separate, as silly as this is to you, young lady. No, no, I have I, a comment I'm going to make. I, I, I just wanted to see what was going on in that interaction. So I transcribed these things just so I could read it back. And the original idea, when we finally decided, when I thought that it might be a, a good book, that I thought someone else would be interested in it. Very small amount of people. I um, wanted to present it as just those transcripts, with with nothing else. Mm -hmm. But then I became friends with Jamie, and he was interested. And stuff. Like Andy Warhol's A. Was well, that that's how model? we presented yeah. it to him. Yeah. To, yeah. yeah. What? Uh, that, do you that want to talk a? about that? Well, we we were discussing how this book would be formatted and what whether images would be in it or not and and um so pete suggested it might be like the andy warhol book a which are basically transcripts of factory sessions of of of, of people on speed but jacking off and, and talking about it but oddly, oddly oral enough, histories those are so in right yeah but now. oddly enough it's, you know, it's, it's actually even more history just run on yeah sentences that, with no respect to any uh total meaning or whether this was well edited or not but, but oddly enough it, it's actually exactly what you're saying about uh, your your question about why didn't I take it to a transcriptionist because that is what actually happened in that particular book uh, Warhol just gave it to somebody and there's all the mistakes and everything different fonts and everything so so the idea of, of, of this was just let it fucking exist as this just approach it as um, text um, where you didn't have to like say uh, you, you you wanted to see what was going on from sentence to sentence, how people were playing, and and this actually goes back to the existential thing: is that what actually would happen is that the the language that you would sort of um, see just reading it that way uh, was that it sounded more like respect in an odd way. It, it actually, um, Jamie is is uh, if if you bought the I'm sort of rambling, but. If you bought it, say, because you wanted to see someone shit on a crackhead, right, that would be how you would buy it. Uh, however, if you actually listen to what's going on, is Jamie is genuinely interested in, in what they were doing. So it, it was a way of getting to know these people, of letting them tell their story. However, there was this pornographic element, which was the sale more than the um, delivery. So this sort of stereotypically, there's this notion that when it comes to pornography, there's like this sort of male thing about being aroused visually, and then the female thing being aroused more sort of like with words and, you know, like erot a lot of erotica is sort of marketed towards women. Having that notion in the back of my mind, I think about you transcribing this. There, there is a thing in there about um, he at one point in the, in the one of the movies he says, "Well, maybe I'm the modern day Desaad," and it's, it's such a cheesy fucking line. But the truth is, he didn't actually sort of get close to Saad until you actually saw it as text, because Saad was a writer, not you know, all the other stuff that you know the rumors or whatever. It doesn't really matter. You're left with the text. You're left with someone's taste in text form. You know, as as 
but you know to sort of separate it from erotica to pornography and all this stuff I, I wouldn't touch that with a barge pole <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of preposterous that i have like a steno pad with notes that <laughs> yeah and, and yet you were laughing at me about doing these transcripts <laughs> i mean well the funny thing is is i actually have had, I, I've transcripted and also sent things off to transcription services, which wow. is why I know a lot about transcription. Mm -hmm. And I know that when you are doing it yourself, it takes a crazy amount of time. Oh, even yeah, if you no know, idea. Even if you know shorthand or yeah. have your own abbreviations and, no. you know. I, I, I'm sure I fucked up, but I, <laughs> I, was, I would spend, you know, hours getting like, uh, uh, uh. I mean, it really was that fucking... Sad, you know, but you know, how else are you gonna find the gems? You know, no, it, it it really was time consuming, but it was, it was something I wanted to do. Were there any parts that you left out that you were like, no, no, you just like you were like, I'm gonna do everything. Well, uh, there's there's actually lines where he would edit it, you know, and so I, I just did that. I just marked where he edited the films, even though he would say it would just be you know long form. That's it. But there were clear edits in it, but um. No, I did it everything stupidly. Did you do every single, like, were there movies that you didn't do? Sure, sure. I mean, he was an actor, you know? So so I was really only sort of interested in um, uh, the things that were actually uh, done this way, this sort of POV way. I mean, there's an interview in there and stuff like that. And there is one that's he was uh, contracted by someone else to do. Uh, and or the interview with another porn star. Well, that's that's Africa. That that was for the same company that hired him to do uh, Humiliation of Heidi, and um, he had to deliver a certain amount of scenes and you know a certain amount of things in this thing. It was, but um, he actually asked me to do that one. I I wouldn't have picked it, but he asked me to do that one later because he won an award for it and he wanted to talk about it. What award was it? I don't know, one of these stupid fucking AVN things, I think. I don't know, Best Gonzo. No, it wasn't Best Gonzo. It was like Best best S&M movie. I don't know. It's a horrible so, thing. So these would be but like... But she cries in it. But the, when she when she cries in the movie, uh, people think it's... I mean, I've heard from other people who think it's a really, really rough film and I swear to you, it's like bad improv to me. But she is crying, but it still it just doesn't come across. And Jamie almost comes... Um, it comes off a little hammy, you know. But but that's I spent a long time with these fucking films, you know. Pete, can what? you talk about the images that are in the book and how they were arrived at? You know, it's horrible because he's prompting me. He knows, and he should fucking tell it. Why don't you talk about the, the pictures, sweetheart? No, because they're they're your decisions. Here, here's the thing. Um, we the the reason the pictures are in there. I didn't want any pictures. And I really I, I just don't want to look at these fucking people. I, I don't want to see this sort of stuff. And the idea was it was just supposed to be text. Adam wanted photos. Jamie was pretty cool with photos. Uh, they thought it would be a, a a better idea, but it was we, when we fought all the time. I mean, Adam and I have known each other for a long time, and Jamie and whatnot. So there was a lot of bickering going on, but it was always friendly. Long story short. A uh, friend of mine, uh, I don't know if you want me to use his name or not, but my uh, dear friend uh, Larry in Los Angeles um, helped me do some screen grabs uh, just to see. And because we, we didn't want to pick the, the sort of more pornographic, um, you know, the, what would constitute pornography legally, we, did, we sort of looked for the more innocent photos. But when we froze them, they actually seemed... Uh, even though if even if it was a seemingly innocent uh, moment, uh, it actually looked very very sinister. So I actually I, I I came around to it that I actually really liked the idea of the photos because it was the sort of opposite of the book, where um, these the, the photos looked a lot worse than what was actually happening. And and I thought that was an interesting sort of pornography uh, in in the sense that you know. Uh, probably more people can masturbate to that than probably would prefer to admit. Yes? Do you want to do anything? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, because you're not getting uh, any awkward, the same sort of awkward uh, visuals you would get if you were watching the rest of the film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's hard to talk about because you just sort of break it down to, like, you know, the special moment when you come or something. You know? So, so it, I mean, it, it's, it's you know, like your focus or something, and then there's all these, you know, lunkheads walking around talking about, you know, what they need to see when they... When they beat off, you know, they beat off four fucking times a day, but you have to have a specific fucking image. So, yeah, it's like, it makes me think of um, 
Chester Brown's book. Was it the Playboy? No. I forget which one. It's all about him collecting the money shots from porn and making, like, a montage sequence yeah. that he can watch. And that, like, yeah. like you know, like, it's like, I guess what I'm saying is, I guess what I'm hearing from you, it makes, it sounds to me like people are very opinionated about what they enjoy. <laughs> like that's my family-friendly version well, of, you well, know. Well, again, I, um, God love opinions. I, I, I think um, I'm... I'm talking more about, I suppose, um, there's this thing in the book about Jean, that Genet says. And uh, it's this idea that the truth is when you masturbate. The idea that when you masturbate that you're only looking at something that you're only so focused on, you know, I don't care if it's a fucking shoe or whatever size, whatever someone wants. Truth is that at that moment, it's quite possible, I shouldn't say it's the truth is, but it's quite possible that you are more than uh, just the voyeur or the performer. I mean, you could be the subject as, as well. Do you know what I mean? You're all of these things at once when you're um, having an orgasm. The audience is part of the creation. <laughs> and then you have to actually think, what exactly did you create? I at least have a book to show, not a little pound of filth. Well, a little pound, good lord, I'm bragging. But No, do you know what I mean? It, it, it's, it's this idea that there's, there's this confluence of, of ideas coming in. You, you can't really control these sort of things. You're not saying that, oh, yeah, you know, I just needed to get laid or I just needed to you know, toss one off or whatever. It, it's, it's a lot of work. There's a lot of different things going on, and I sort of wanted to capture that. Well put. Well, hardly. But <laughs> thank you for trying. <laughs> Adam, is that, what you, is that what you were trying to pull out of him? Like, Ooh, that... so to speak. <laughs> I mean, you got to be careful with your language. I know. There's right? no way <laughs> to not, you know, anyway. No, no, really. That that as, as Peter was saying, that we we were going back and forth on the book as text and the images, and that was an interesting back and forth about what the what I could see Peter's idea of all text book. I was for that for a while. And then then we discovered when all these screen grabs are gotten, it, as Pete was saying, this looks crazy weird. This looks freaky. That was, I didn't want to leave that out of the book if we get a sense of these things. And as Pete suggests, there may not even be, suggests the reality of the situation, but then is porn real, you know, and mm -hmm. the, particularly these things? What is the reality of it? It's an interesting question and a way of going back and forth. And again, the designer, Hetty, was really great about that. The integrating them in the book. He, he actually developed this rhythm to it, and, and you wouldn't. I don't know if, if people will get that, but it was it was phenomenal when he came on. And and the the photos don't, um, they don't correspond to the chapters. They they run a different way, uh, and that that was done consciously. So that it, the they weren't illustrations of the text. They were separate photos done in this very very specific way. Again, I don't. I, it's it's almost wrong to explain it, but it it. it, it it's because it's it's not like a game or something that you had to figure out, but it is this incredible thought that went into it. Uh, Hetty and Adam uh, did an incredible amount of work on that stuff. So, so are you saying that, like, when I like, if I'm looking at the book and I see the picture there, mm -hmm. that the text that's with it is not it, that Voila. that picture is not from that that's particular. Right. Correct. That's right. And you know why? No. Why? <laughs> Because we weren't uh, illustrating the, the thing. that We didn't want this to be this thing. We wanted this to be a longer uh, say. Uh, I hate to use this fucking word, but it was, it was a longer conversation. It was a bigger subject. It wasn't just a book about pornography or a, a pornographic book in that you could masturbate to it. Or, or it wasn't sold for that. It wasn't done for that. It was actually addressing a much bigger subject. So that there was... Um, uh, a conversation again, if you will, uh, that, that sort of traveled through to a sort of totality. That there was something bigger than everything in there. And if you notice the back cover, uh, the images um, almost wiped out. And actually, the yeah, last few pages. That's what I'm saying. So it, it sort of moves to that. So it's uh, maybe there's something a... to that fairly academic concept or a pornographic material, but I respect that. The problem is is actually separating it. 
you know, yeah. say, saying, oh, yeah, this part's academic, this part's porno pornography. Right. I mean, it, it's ridiculous to sort of say that. Sort of stuff, you know? yeah, as far as I'm concerned. Because one is, I don't know, pornography, not academic. Well, I personally, <laughs> this is the most complete conversation I've heard about this book from Pete. <laughs> because really usually it's just me swearing at him on the phone. phone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really, really the, 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 what comes across in this book for me is that it's a tremendous amount of work for very, very, very little. I think you say that in the book, or maybe you said it at the event. Last. I pretty much say it every fucking day. I mean, you know, I can't order a fucking hamburger, you know, without saying it. But no, it's, it's, uh, it's just this, um, there's a tremendous importance placed on, Adam was saying earlier, wasn't he? So we have to talk about sex and death. And, stuff. and then there's Foucault saying that sex is actually talking about it. You know, that this is, is the truth is, this stuff wouldn't exist sex wouldn't be interesting if this sort of thing didn't exist you know it's it's not about fucking it's about everything but fucking but and not not <laughs> everything but, right right, yeah, right. Other, um, other than but well, fucking okay. yeah yeah well she got it quicker than you <laughs> i can't help but think about like there's a lot of communication going on yeah you know it's almost like Especially with the whole breaking of the fourth wall and addressing the audience, you know, mm -hmm. like, and then, like, sometimes he'll, you know, like, they're having a conversation, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, like, he's giving them stage directions, for yeah, yeah. lack of a better term, mm -hmm. um, but, like, the fact that there's, like, negotiation about how to do this and, like, mm. how it's executed and, like, you know, that, like, you hear the director talking and, you know, that, like, it's about, I mean, in some ways, it's like about human interaction. Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, hence, one, one, once again, the existential thing. It, it, it is a larger idea. And, and it's, uh, as I said, what I came across with, uh, in the transcripts is that there is a great deal of respect. Um, given. The, the problem with saying that is that it sounds like you want respect. And, and you can't sort of do this sort of stuff. And, and walk away from it, saying that, oh, you know, I can, I can pretty this up. I can clean this up. I can say that there is actually this sort of communication. Because ultimately what you'd come away with, as far as I'm concerned, is that, you know, fuck it. Fuck the, you know, this idea that communication exists or is worth something. That, to me, would be ugly. Do you, do you know what I mean? So, so it's, it's a much uglier idea. Uh, and, and what I wanted in the book, and, and, and whatever I do when Adam's going to fucking kill me, but uh, is, is that I, I really want to um, stop having these things, that um, these ideas that uh, they somehow can be cleaned up. I want to do something or to pinpoint that thing in this stuff that wouldn't let you walk away from it, you know, that wouldn't let you sort of... Well, the reason I called it existential actually is more specific because when I read the transcripts, the only thing I thought of was the Sartre play, No Exit. Yeah. You know, we're stuck with each other in a way and fucking with each other in a way to get our own sort of jollies in there. What moves us personally? And it's sort of like um, you can't uh, ascend through that world to a different uh, spiritual basis, you know. Mm. That's where you are, and that's it. But you see, the, the, the problem with that, with that, that would be a philosophical application right but like say, say yeah. if you took it if you're looking for another sort of existential type you know heavy quotes again but like with maybe um selby's the room well any anyway, the idea that, that suddenly thought is is generating thought it, it's it's uh, i mean there's a lot of things going on and i don't want to sort of get into the selby book but th this idea that um these obsessions become real you don't actually know what's going on you can see where these things begin they're just constantly going on the difference uh, for me, and, and, and this is uh, the impolite part, is that this is fairly exciting. You have to, at some point, take a responsibility for it. Not responsibility outward, I mean, you can be as embarrassed as I am, but you, at some point, you want to own this. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, so that, that would be the difference. The idea is, is that uh, at, some, at some point you would find uh, pleasure in this, make, make something worthwhile, and that, that idea would be an ugly thing to admit, and and it isn't. Um, uh, I don't know what the word in PC, frankly, and and 
there's a, a quote that I use in the book, and, and uh, of course Sartre wrote uh, Genet, and it's the um, the failure of pleasure. I'm gonna fuck this up. The uh, failure of pleasure is the acid pleasure and failure. The failure of pleasure is the acid. Wait, say it again. Is the acid pleasure and failure? And failure. No, no, wait. The opposite. I had it. <laughs> yeah, but the idea the idea that it's self generating, that, that this is ultimately a failure. And the fact that you recognize that it's pleasurable and uh, 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 a failure ultimately tells you that this is pleasurable. But it is ultimately a horrible, horrible failure. You know? Mm-hmm. So, I see it as a victory. <laughs> All right, that was the most recent episode of the Quimby's Bookstore podcast, uh, featuring interviews with Peter Sotos and Adam Parfrey. The books that we talked about, uh, many of them are available at Quimby's Bookstore at 1854 West North Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, in the lovely Wicker Park neighborhood. Uh, You can also find us on the web uh, at quimbies.com, Q-U-I, M as in money, B as in boy, Y, S as in Sam, dot com. We look forward to seeing you soon. <laughs> Go into what I had for breakfast. What did I have for dinner last night? Yogurt. I, Nothing I, but I really, tolerant. How dare you? I'm intolerant. You're tolerant. <laughs> <laughs>